Hello everyone. Welcome back to Excellence Talks. As usual, together with Dr. Forstner, we have a guest, this time from another continent, Asia, from Japan. Brittany Arthur specializes in innovation, design thinking, and advises Japanese companies and individuals on how to implement creativity in the workplace. In the previous episode of Excellence Talk, we talked with Brittany about confidently leading conversation in your non-native language. Today's part, we will talk about how to create a creative workplace to drive innovation in Japan and also in all other countries. Welcome, Brittany. Thank you so much for having me, Murad and Dr. Christian. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Really, thank you so much. So you are supporting your clients for creating a creative workspace to drive innovation in Japan. So you do it in the, your non-native language also. It's another aspect. What are your suggested ways, strategies that you can advise to us to create a creative working space? When we're thinking about creative workspaces, if there's one thing that I would encourage organizations to do is to become a learning organization. And so if we've seen anything um, with, with this pandemic, um, that we've seen that there is always opportunity in crisis. If anything, if you look at the kanji for a crisis and opportunity, they actually have, they share um, a similar, or they, they share the same kanji. So um, the kanji for, for danger plus another kanji is, is means a crisis and then the other kanji to like to meet plus this other kanji then means opportunity so it's it's very interesting that even linguistically in in, in asia there is this or in in japanese as well there is a there is this concept that there is always opportunity in crisis so i would encourage organizations to become a learning organization number one so you can do things like um, we, we used to, you know, I, a very simple example would be we used to do five-year plans, right? Five-year plans. Where are we going to be in five years? Where are we going to be in 10 years? Um, we saw, for example, it's, it's always important to have that long-term view in mind. Where's the North Star? What are we trying to achieve? But rather than attaching that to a five-year plan, probably what we need to do is, is become more of an agile organization, more of an adaptive organization, and then and, and, and develop as the world develops. That doesn't mean that you just kind of act like a feather in the wind and you don't have strategy. What it means is, is that we build an adaptive strategy into how we operate. So doing things like you know, implementing design thinking uh, as a way to, to launch projects. So if we were to look at, you know, the big, if the Japanese financial year begins April 1st. So if we were to look at um, April 1st of last year, when they were forecasting for 2020, um, you can imagine um, what kind of, you know, data they had. They thought we're going to have all this tourism from the Olympics, where, you know, we're going to, you know, it's going to be just as good as those bubble years. And then, boom, January 2020, Olympics are cancelled. Um, they lose tourism money, not only from the Olympics, but general tourism money. They lose domestic spending. Domestic spending in Japan is down 20% this year. So, and then you think, okay, we promised these initiatives in our organization, you know, X amount of budget, but we don't have that cash in the organization anymore. So what can we do? So you, you come from this idea of a learning organization and say, okay, rather than this kind of cost saving, squeezing the towel idea, what we want to do is create new opportunities um, to, 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 to bring in either resources, cash, people, talent um, into the organization rather than just keep into that five-year plan that's maybe not serving us anymore. Do you think that this is uh, advice is specifically for Japan or it can be implemented in the other countries? Can they be universal? That's such a great point, Murat. I think when we look at that everything has changed except human nature, right? So everything's changed except human nature. And that there, there are these concepts. And at the end of the day, uh, what we're trying to do is create a human organization. And I think that the, the humanity remains the same, but certainly um, there, are, there are tweaks or certain, uh, certain characteristics that are, that, are, that are characteristic of Asia um, that I would encourage people to keep in mind. It's the same thing, you know, when people are eating food, some countries like food more spicy, other countries like food less spicy. And that's very similar in a, in a, in a business context that will have countries whose maybe issue is not that their employees don't speak up enough, maybe their issue is that they speak up too much, right? But either way, what we've got is we've got a communication issue. So definitely, you know, we have that 
we have those elements of um, that connect humanity, i.e. they will have a communication issue. But the question is on the spectrum, is your company or your culture or your country on the end that you talk too much or you don't talk enough? You know, so I would encourage that certainly there are connectivity or there's that element of connectivity amongst humanity in general, but certainly also look at what's relevant to, to, your, to your region and to your company as well. I really like you mentioning humanity again and again. And uh, in one of our uh, other um, excellence talks, we invited two people from South Africa, a black guy and a white one. There was, uh, the topic was Ubuntu, which is a very old uh, value in Africa. And um, Ubuntu can be translated into I am since you are, right? And, and this is all about humanity. So it's the African version of humanity that, that's amazing. One of your biggest passions is design thinking. And many people have heard about design thinking, but only very few can explain it. You can do that, right? And, and what, is, what, what makes design thinking so unique as a tool? Design thinking has certainly um, become a little bit of a, of a buzzword, but you really just, it's, it's, it's very simple to explain. It's the idea that it's a, it's a mindset and a set of tools at the same time. So the mindset is that what we do is we design business or we design products and services with the user in mind. And the other part of design thinking is that we then use different tools to do that. So it's, it's all about people, but it's, it's really a, a set of tools that you can, can call on depending on, depending on your, your situation. So for example, what we're looking to do is rather than launch a new product or launch a new service and then, you know, kind of pray that, you know, that, that it works, what we do is we go back to the idea of, you know, Murat's point, which we said, okay, actually there are many elements that, that are universal we go back to the idea that we're going to design for people rather than we're just building a product because what we want what we understand is products change services change but people are less likely to change as fast as a product or service does so if we design for our consumer in mind we see a few things we see that we, we create more sustainable processes because when you know we're using our resources both people talent and money and time really um efficiently so we don't just you know launch launch products without knowing kind of how they how they work also design thinking is is very much based on the idea that we want to learn from people as much as possible we design for people but we learn from them so we deliver them a product or a service in an incomplete format so that we encourage feedback and the reason why we want to get that kind of thing back early is that before we kind of finish and put, you know, put the fine polishing touches and things like that on a product, we want to make sure that, that the button is on the right side or that we didn't... I've heard horror stories like products being, you know, medical products being in the, in, in, in the design process, but this is without design thinking, for three years, four years, and they launch it and they go to the hospitals and the hospitals say, well, you're either too late or this particular example was they put the button on the wrong side of, of where the doctors would, would usually stand. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is the kind of thing that if you don't get back to that and those very simple idea of just talking to people, um, this can have catastrophic business, um, business implications. So design thinking is all about bringing often new, but it's not always completely new. You know, often we just work with, you know, we work with existing assets and then what we want to do is then improve our existing processes or products um, with people in mind and then we use a diverse set of tools to do that. And in organizations who use design thinking, Brittany, how can their leaders support these people uh, in, well, or broadly speaking, innovation? And what would be preferable leadership behaviors to right. support that? Yes, I think that's, um, that's such a critical point, Dr. Christian. It's really about um, having that kind of top-down but equally bottom-up approach. So how can we approach this from, from both ends of the organization? So leadership, uh, design thinking is about creating or talking with people, thinking it, thinking of people, and then learning. The design thinking process is really about learning. So what we really are looking for in leaders is for them to build and encourage learning organizations. So when their people or their products go to the customer with an 80%, like with a prototype, for example, we don't need leaders saying things like, well, that's not finished or that's not perfect or things like that. We want leaders to have the kind of conversations or the kind of communication like, 
we learn something, you know, it's not a failure, we learn something, things like that. So certainly the idea we need leaders to, to buy into the idea that business needs to transition from strict products and services to building for people. And building for people is not this kind of, you know, uh, nice to have warm, fuzzy idea of, isn't it nice that we, you know, we just build something for someone, you know, that we understand that there is certainly a business case behind it. And if anything, it, it helps organizations become uh, ambidextrous organizations where we not only have our mainstream business, but in implementing design thinking can also help organizations run their mainstream business, but also have spin-offs. You know, maybe it's an innovation lab or maybe it's a particular project. So we want to see organizations and leadership really pushing the idea of learning and the, and the way that maybe we'll see that a little bit more uh, practically is that we also need to see speed. So we need organizations to create processes and structures or ecosystems. We need to get, we need decision-making processes to be shorter. We need to give or we need to disseminate power amongst the people so that, or autonomy amongst the people so that they know where they can make decisions and where not, when they need to call on management support and when not. Um, so I'd really encourage leaders to do, to do those two things. One, really lead through behavior modeling that you're a learning organization. And then the second thing is to also create those, um, those processes and ecosystems that support people uh, in, in becoming or, you know, in, to be able to operate with speed. Because design thinking is also about multidisciplinary talent. It's, about, it's not about us having the same knowledge. It's about, you know, 30% of the same knowledge. It's about, you know, me having 100% of one knowledge, Dr. Christian, you having another 100%, another 100% you having the other 100%. So together, um, you know, we're, we're a stronger, more robust team because organizations are dealing with issues we've never seen before. Uh, we've never dealt with a, with a pandemic um, with this level of internet connectivity before. Um, so what we really need is a diverse perspective uh, you know, to solve challenges. So we create, you know, more robust solutions for the future. And how, how would you characterize it? Excellent organizations uh, who does it all right? And uh, what would that mean for innovation at the end? Right. I think an excellent an, an excellent organization is is so much for me really about what what you what you're doing with excellence talks. For me, an excellent organization is an organization that encourages dialogue because dialogue is learning. And I think the idea of excellence, yeah, for me, certainly that idea of dialogue, but then there's also, I have this, I, I would love to see that people show up with their skills more. So for example, one thing that we see in design thinking um, is that we, we don't, you know, we don't flatten uh, the playing field and say, okay, we're all equal. We do the opposite. We say, okay, we're all specialists and you don't need to know, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, we see this often, for example, in, a, in an Asian context or in a Japanese context um, with what do we do about the hierarchy? How can we get, you know, um, a, a junior person and the CEO working in the same team? Well, that's easy. If we say, okay, you're, you're equal, this isn't, this isn't going to work. You know, it's, we've tried it. It hasn't worked. What we do is we say, okay, CEO, we want you to speak as the CEO position because you know the best about what it means to be a CEO of this company. So that's what we need you to do. Whereas, you know, maybe there's a junior person or maybe there's someone who's recently transitioned to the company. And then we say, we need you to speak with that voice because the CEO doesn't know what it's like to have recently transferred to this company or something. So we really need to create organizations that encourage learning and, in, and encourage dialogue. And I think that the coronavirus pandemic has really shifted the idea that it has to be perfect to, I think the touch points have become uh, a little bit more accessible. Like usually if you wanted to kind of have a, uh, you know, a conversation with, with leadership, you would do this whole logistics kind of celebration with you you would do like a like a, a conference and then get catering and invite all these people and send out invitations six months in advance and so you would lose speed but, you know but something that we've seen now is that you can be an organization or send an email out to your people and say monday morning everyone let's get on a call at 9 a.m because you know we have something to tell you you know these are the kinds of organizations that i think are excellent and also we really want excellent places to work at right and so excellent places to work at for people are places where people feel that they have autonomy in their work and that they're also you know appreciated so for me this is it's such an important topic what an excellent 
organization looks like. And I think the only way forward is really to do what you're doing with Excellence Talks is to continue the dialogue. So there's a strong connection between uh, dialogue and learning uh, and innovation. Excellence is a journey, uh, Brittany, as you know, and also innovation is a journey. And if how the organizations can balance the profit and the long-term growth with innovation, and especially in the crisis time. Yeah, absolutely. This is such an important topic. Um, a few things come to mind. Firstly, if you're a larger organization, it's not about pivoting, throwing all the plans away, and then you know, in, in investing in something new. What we're really trying to do is build organ incumbent organizations. And so what that means is we want to have an organization that has their mainstream business model, but we also want an organization to even leverage the assets of that uh, mainstream business model, be it maybe it's their clients, uh, maybe it's a certain software or technology, or maybe it's certain relationships or networks, whatever it may be, to encourage how might this mainstream business model grow or expand through new opportunities. So I would encourage organizations, larger organizations, to think about how they can use their mainstream business model as a landing pad for a kind of spin-off organizations. If you're a smaller organization, and for example, you know, because we're looking at really, you know, tough times for people. Imagine if you have a restaurant, you're one person and you've had a restaurant. Now, you know, you, you don't have a mainstream business to really leverage. What you do have is assets of that particular business. So you might have a customer list, for example. I would then encourage you to think about, okay, how can we bring value to these customers? How might we be able to take our organization and then pivot so I think if you have a restaurant in the times of COVID I honestly don't think um, uh, you know check a few tweaks is, is gonna be enough I really do think you have to look directly at your business model so if you don't necessarily want to change uh, your business ie take the restaurant as an example if you don't want to change your business because that's what you do okay well let's look at your business model maybe we can go into a subscription base so do you want to go to okay maybe we do monthly deliveries or you do box deliveries or something like that. Um, but we really need um, to think about that innovation is not about starting from starting from zero. For me, often if innovation, particularly um, as you very well mentioned, uh, during times of crisis, I would really encourage companies to not start at square one, but to start at square two and leverage uh, existing assets in the organization. Thank you very much, Brittany. It's a great message. I have the last question. This is actually the big question that we have always that we keep it to the last. What are the key messages you can give to the world to make the world better and excellent? That's such a special question. And I, I think that's, I really applaud you for, for asking this question each time. For me, it's about, and you know, we talked about what it means to speak in your non-native language and then design thinking. And people might think, what does that have to do with each other? And for me, it's really about finding ways for each person in the world to speak up and to share their knowledge and their talent. You know, and I think that design thinking is a, is a great way because there are certain um, strategies or there are certain tools that we can use to help leverage voices. So for example, we don't do things like, we don't ideate uh, through discussion, we ideate through, through writing so that people uh, don't, you know, that everyone has a voice and you don't get kind of influenced by other people. Um, so I would just, I, I think that the, the really number one thing is about how we can find ways for each person to contribute their talent to the world because the kinds of challenges that we're dealing with um, now and definitely over the next five years are new. And so what we need is diverse perspectives so that we, at the end of the day, we can create more robust solutions that are maybe even more meaningful or even maybe more sustainable. As you give the message, we wanted to give uh, opportunities for the platform so people can speak up and then share their precious knowledge like you share with us. Thank you very much. It was a great insight. It was a pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure and I really applaud you for the work that you're doing in Excellence Talks and for anyone listening or, or watching, I certainly encourage you to, to understand that Excellence Talks are, are certainly a dialogue. So go ahead and share your thoughts uh, in the comments as well. Thank you again, Brittany, for extremely valuable comments and helps and tips. Thank you. You will also share your business karaoke, Japanese and English together. You will put it into the YouTube channel under the title. So people can of also course. Come connect come over you. and visit us. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure.
Thank you. As a last message I want to give to our audience that if you want to be notified for our next videos, please subscribe to the YouTube channel that you can notify for the next videos. Thank you very much again. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.